of the Digital India Dialogue series. This series is a collaborative initiative supported by National E-Governance Division, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India, United Nations Development Programme and Intel India. To set the context of today's session, may I please invite Mr. Vinay Thakur, COO of National E-Governance Division, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India, to tell us more about the program, its progeny and future plans. Sir, you also hold the charge of additional Director General, Bhaskar Charya National Institute for Space Applications and Geoinformatics and have more than 25 years of experience in implementing IT and e-governance projects. Over to you, sir. Uh, very good morning. Thank you, Swati. And very warm welcome to all the participants. I could see a uh, uh, few very senior government uh, people also joining us today. Uh, would like to welcome all the people, uh, my boss, uh, uh, President CEO of NEGD, CEO of MyGov and an MD of Digital India Corporation, uh, uh, who will be telling us about the possible applications of deep learning today. And Sir has been driving uh, this particular series of Digital India Dialogue. Uh, thankful to Intel, the entire team under uh, Ms. Sweta Khurana, Saloni, Swati and everyone uh, for uh, standing with us, supporting uh, this wonderful series. And uh, today uh, uh, we have a wonderful list of uh, rather two very important people who are expert in the field of AI, ML and uh, uh, deep learning. Mr. Vahan Marty Rosian, who is a data science lead with UNDP Armenia and Mr. Romesh Tiku, the principal engineer with Intel. Uh, so would like to welcome also uh, them also to this uh, uh, city, uh, to this event. Uh, so the journey of uh, 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 India has been working uh, and started working in AI for last couple of years and then few applications we have already uh, uh, implemented and seen some of the solutions being used. Uh, uh, but then deep learning is uh, one such area which is a subset of uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence which uh, deep dive into uh, the various solutions, the real world problems which are really confusing, sometimes complex and time taking. So the algorithms around uh, deep learning uh, are very, very crucial in providing the solutions related to uh, uh, these complex problems. So uh, we will be learning more about these uh, uh, techniques and tools and uh, uh, related algorithms today. Uh, but while we compare uh, uh, machine learning and then deep learning, so machine learning, you train uh, your computer to certain level and then do a lot of manual work also around that. Uh, so at the smaller level, probably the machine learning pro provide a better performance, but at a higher level where we have million of objects and so manual work and manual feeding probably is not going to work. So we need the algorithms which can automatically learn and then generate the features, generate the solutions uh, for other problems. So many uh, deep learning is nowadays being applied in many fields like medical, e-commerce, entertainment, uh, starting from robotics where robot can probably do the task and then identify and detect the objects around it. And then self-driving car is another example where it analyzes the environment, objects, identify, distinguish them, and then make these cars to run. And even the translation where we are also working right now on NLTM to see the possible solutions where uh, translation uh, between these languages, one language to another language, whether it is text to text or text to speech and vice versa can be made possible. So these are few of applications and we will be continuing with uh, this series with uh, many more uh, deep dive sessions around that. And uh, I am hopeful that today's uh, session is going to be very, very interesting and uh, uh, it will be very, very fruitful to everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Swati. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would now like to uh, invite Mr. Abhishek Singh to provide the opening remark and set the context for the session. Sir, you are an IAS officer of 1995 batch. You're currently managing three core portfolios as CEO MyGov, 
with additional charge of President and CEO NEGD, and also MD and CEO Digital India Corporation. You have a master's degree in public administration from Harvard Kennedy uh, School of Government and a BTEC and MTech from IIT Kanpur. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Swati, and uh, thank you, Vinay, for the opening remarks. And uh, uh, indeed, an honor and privilege to uh, for NEGD and uh, Ministry of Electronics and IT to host this edition of Digital India Dialogues. And uh, I thank our partners, Ms. Intel and UNDP, for helping us structure this and get the speakers. And today we have very distinguished speakers, as uh, Vinay was mentioning, Mr. Omer Tiku, who is the Principal Engineer Research Manager from Intel Labs, and Mr. Vahan Marti Roshan from Data Science Lead from UNDP Armenia National SDG Innovation Lab. So welcome to you all and thank you for uh, giving your time for this session. And a little bit of context, like Digital India Dialogues is a series that uh, we started last year, especially in the wake of the pandemic when physical meetings were difficult to hold and it was important to keep the conversations going on in order to demystify AI in order to uh, to enhance adoption of AI and uh, data science and deep learning based algorithms for applications in for solving uh, for solving solutions uh, at the societal scale. So in order to do this, we started this series and so far this is the uh, this is seventh edition of Digital India Dialogues. We have had more than we have had six sessions in the past with 20 speakers from across industry, from academia, from government coming and sharing thoughts uh, on various topics which are related to uh, applications of AI in healthcare, applications of AI in, in education, for responsible AI, for building confidence in AI, for role of AI in GovTech, role of AI for social good. So various topics of uh, and applications of AI has been uh, discussed. And what we do is that in these sessions, they are not the typical webinar in which uh, we just kind of uh, explain what we are trying to what the theoretical aspects of AI, but we also give real use cases and uh, kind of uh, demos with regard to show which shows how such applications have actually been used. And then what we find is that after the sessions, uh, many state governments and many departments do get in touch with us with regard to how they can adopt a solution. So it becomes a more of a practical uh, application of uh, AI and and, uh, and working towards its more adoption within the government and uh, across. So, so these sessions uh, are uh, not only contributing to capacity building, but also leading to more and more adoption of such solutions. And as we know, deep learning and AI solutions become better as we adopt uh, adopt them all the more we have had uh, uh, when we come to deep learning it's like it's like uh, based on uh, it basically relates to like how do we make our solutions better based on the data that we have based on the compute capability that we have how do we make algorithms to train machines better i'm sure omesh will be I'm sure Omesh will be explaining it in much greater detail with regard to uh, what deep learning is, what AI is, and how we can adopt it for learning better. But I would just uh, kind of, I would like to refer to just uh, one example that we uh, we have been working with, with a, for a sol solution developed by a company called Netra, in which uh, they have done 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 a, developed an AI based solution for diabetic retinopathy, in which uh, in which uh, we are able to use uh, data science and AI based tool to detect which are the more probable cases of uh, retinopathy. And they have done it with a solution with a, with a data set for around 300, uh, 3000 patients. And with that, they are able to detect uh, diabetic retinopathy to a 98% accuracy, which is similar to what human doctors would do. Similarly, we had applications in uh, Tamil Nadu, you know, uh, which uh, a project called eParvai, wherein, uh, wherein uh, Deep learning and AI tools were used to detect cataract. And again, the images of cataract patients taken it for and with a tool analyzed so that it will it will be able to screen patients who might require cataract surgery. There have been similar applications done for you know, done for diagnosis of breast cancer and diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis and all these things. All these solutions basically go back on being able to create data sets and being able to identify ways and means in which you will be able to use those data sets to train the machine for better uh, predictions and better uh, modeling. Then, uh, then another use case that I can talk of, I can use of, which we are trying to do in the government is by using uh, uh, 
by using uh, authentication of people by using face recognition so uh, one key problem that we have in india is like uh, is like for every pensioner who gets pensions they need to uh, they need to prove to a public authority that they are alive and very often it used to be a lot of hardship for old uh, people to go to public office and uh, in order to get their jeevan praman certificate to, as it is called so for that, that uh, those who are mr bhardwaj can you be mute so so hmm. for that this solution has been developed which allows face recognition to authenticate people and it matches with the it matches with the pictures on their aadhar so their identity is also proved so this solution has been developed by unique identification authority of india it has been experimented in telangana it is being done in jharkhand so that that again solves a problem uh, of uh, that many pensioners were facing uh-huh. so similarly there are other solutions as when i was mentioning with regard to applications of deep learning in the language mm-hmm. technologies like how do we how do we enable voice based okay, internet मिस्टर भारद्वाज कैन यू बी म्यूट अरे दवा पर दोबारा करें हम कहेंगे आलोक जाएगा दूसरी घास भिजवा देंगे ये भी नहीं बताएंगे कितना भिजवा रहे बस भिजवा दें टीम प्लीज अनम्यूट म्यूट द कंसर्न पर्सन प्लीज सॉरी सर सॉरी अभिषेक सर यू हैव टू अनम्यूट सर सर आप you are not able to sorry so uh, uh, so what i was saying was that the applications of deep learning and uh, and uh, deep learning would be also be there in the national language translation mission wherein because wherein we are working on to go on to offer services in multiple indian languages as also enabling services of voice interface because uh, if we have to onboard the next 500 million people on to internet on 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 to the web based services they would require a voice interface and that would require training our tools in order to identify not only english and hindi but various indian languages we already have taken up some projects in this direction and the work is being done and hopefully we will be seeing some results very soon but that all relates to the potential of deep learning the potential of data science and all that is being made uh, possible because the ex- rapid expansion that we have in compute technologies and uh, i was also looking at uh, a solution over the weekend that has been developed in estonia wherein how public services are being offered through through a voice based interface and through uh, in multiple languages so those projects have lot of applications in india and i'm sure the undp expert from mr wahan from armenia who is here he will be mentioning about how undp is supporting similar projects in armenia and elsewhere and the whole endeavor for this digital india dialogues is to bring together such solutions wherein technology has been used to solve uh, societal problems and create a gov stock of uh, shareable solutions and with the help of undp whatever india has done we are willing to share it to any other country for adoption elsewhere and at the same time if any other country or anywhere in the world or any other corporation or any other tech company has developed solutions how do we adopt it for adoption in india how do we scale it up because the value for these solutions will come in uh, scaling up and once the kind of size and uh, that we have in india the kind of population that we have in india many of these solutions will definitely get much better once we look at its applications its adoption and actual implementation uh, within the country so with these remarks i would uh, once again welcome uh, mr omesh and uh, mr wahan for this session and all the participants who have joined in from all over the country today for this session and look forward to an engaging session with regard to learning what ai is what deep, you know, what machine deep, deep learning is in what ways it can be applied in what ways we can use it in in what ways we can make public services more accessible more affordable and better for everyone so thank you once again intel and undp for helping us structure this and my own capabilities team and look forward to hearing from uh, the distinguished speakers of the day swati over to you swati you are mute swati you have to unmute swati if you can unmute yourself i think she got Not disconnected we can't hear you yeah
So Loni, you can only call the next speaker. It's fine. Ah, so you sure. Have some problem there. Yeah, yeah, I think. So um, thank you so much, uh, sir. And it's always a pleasure listening to you. We always get to hear something new. And we hope that, you know, the today's session, our speakers are also able to take forward some of the things that you've mentioned and talk a little more detail about it. So with that, um, I would now request our next speaker, uh, Mr. Umesh Tikku from Intel. Um, Umesh, we're looking forward to hear from you about deep learning and how all of us can learn it more, understand it more. And also the kind of people that we have in audiences today, they will be able to take it forward in terms of implementation, in terms of adding it and making it part of the policy and the lawmaking for a better uh, uh, for a better delivery of citizen services. So over to you, Mesh. Can you guys hear me? Yes. And is the right uh, file uh, showing up? Uh, because yes. I have like two views here. OK. Thank you, Saloni, and thank you very much for the kind words of introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, my name is Omesh Tiku, part of Interlabs. Uh, I run a small AI research group in Interlabs. I'm also a principal engineer there. Uh, today, uh, I'm just going to speak a little bit about uh, what deep learning is as a technology, try to demystify a little bit, and then a few examples of where it's used. Obviously, the uses are lots, and we can't cover it all in, in the time we have. But hopefully we'll do some justice to the uh, users that are more relevant to uh, organizational or government level kind of applications. Uh, with that, uh, let me just get the pointer on this thing. Okay. So uh, just an introduction on AI. I'll go from AI to deep learning in a second, but uh, let's look at what does artificial intelligence mean and here, I want to just go back a step and talk about flying, right? Our, our journey with making airplanes and uh, actually uh, sorry, uh, uh, kind of being motivated by birds, right? We, we wanted to fly, and the best example that we had in front of us when we designed machines that could fly was birds. And we ended up, over centuries of progress, uh, make flying machines. Uh, we have lots of them, lots of variants of them today, but none of them work like a bird. They all do the job, but they necessarily don't replicate the mechanism of the bird. So it is a flying machine, but it's not a bird. Similarly, an artificial intelligence, intelligent machine is an intelligent machine. It, it can sort of uh, quote unquote think and, and behave cognitively, but it's not a human being. It's not a human mind, so to say. So what is the definition of artificial intelligence then if it's not a human, right? So in 1950, uh, Alan Turing, uh, Devise what we today know as know as Turing test or or an imitation game. The idea here is very simple. Uh, we have this observer marked here by C. He or she is behind the screen, and uh, she's trying to communicate with another entity or an agent behind behind this wall. Now, this agent could be a machine, a computer A, or it could be another human B. And this whole communication between between C and A or B is happening through this wall wherein C basically sends in a query, maybe in a written form or a typed form through the wall, and it gets a response and she gets a response back. And this happens for a few exchanges. And after a sufficient number of exchanges, we ask this observer C, can you tell us whether you were communicating with a computer or you were communicating with a human being? And if the person uh, or the subject C is not able to convincingly detect whether the entity or the agent behind the wall is a computer, when it was a computer, we, we can say that we have a machine that's artificially intelligent. So going back to the, the analogy of, uh, of flying, right? We, we have something that acts like a human. It could be in a very constrained context of this conversation. It may not be an intelligent entity that can work in every single scenario, but for this particular conversation, it does. And it's an artificially intelligent system. And that Turing test is kind of the gold test being applied to anything that we want to call artificially intelligent now. So with that introduction, let's just move on and talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. We use these terms quite a lot these days. Uh, this is definitely the summer for artificial intelligence and, and we have has been for some years now. Uh, there's a direct comparison to human behavior in many cases, uh, but at a very high level, right? AI or artificial uh, intelligence enables machines to learn from experience. Basically, they look at a lot of data and they try to understand what this data is telling them. 
and then perform cognitive functions that are associated usually with human mind. We don't associate cognitive functions with machines generally. And by cognition, again, the definition for cognition varies quite a bit. But what we mean by that is a machine that can do more than what a programmer tells it, right? Usually, traditionally, when we program a machine to do something, we have to give it the steps of how to go about doing it. But for a cognitively uh, able machine, it's just looking at the data, understanding the structures under the data automatically, and then acting accordingly on new data that it sees. So the comparison to human behavior comes from the fact that there is sensing, which is a human looking, listening, touching, you know, those kinds of sensory behaviors and similar behaviors are replicated in a machine. Uh, they have cameras, they have microphones, you know, they can read text and they can, you know, uh, pass through text, etc. And after that sensing, there's a reasoning aspect where it tries to go beyond just looking at an object, but understanding the relationship between different objects or different words in a sentence. So that reasoning is then followed by some kind of an action. So every agent has a goal. A robot needs to pick an item and put it somewhere else. A chatbot needs to answer a question. So using sensing, using reasoning, being able to act on that data, and then repeating this process and adapting over time, because you are actually not just acting on the data, you're also seeing more data and you can get better over time, is, is what that cycle tends to be. And that's the loose definition of what cognitive means in, in artificial intelligence world. When we come to machine learning, it's a subfield of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, anything cognitive, right? But artificial because it's not a human. But machine learning is more centric around algorithms whose performance improve as they are exposed to more data over time. So this is completely a data-driven approach where we don't necessarily program anything that, that tells the machine how to behave. So that's another subset of artificial intelligence, but still quite a huge set of algorithms that fall into machine learning. And then we come to the last but not the least and, and the topic of today, the deep learning. It's a subset of machine learning where it does learn from data. But there's a specific structure to these algorithms, which uh, we like to say is, is influenced by how brains are wired with different neurons in our brain. And those neurons are, are trained or they are taught to act in certain ways depending on the data they see. And that particular structure when employed to do machine learning or do artificial intelligence is called deep learning. And uh, again, we have uh, we have some time to go deeper into what exactly that structure means and how it works. But this is kind of the hierarchy of where deep learning sits with respect to machine learning and, and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so the overarching discipline of artificial intelligence is basically a form of intelligence, a type of technology. If you love study, depending on who you ask and what the context of conversation is, Within that, we talk about narrow AI, which is an example I just gave in the previous slide, where a person was speaking to a machine across this wall, but the context could have been just some subject or some topic, or I could have a robot in a, in a factory trying to, for example, look at uh, some defects or, or put some parts together. So it's intelligent, but it's intelligent in that context. I can't take the same robot in my kitchen and ask it to cook, cook a meal for me. It just doesn't know how to do that, but it's still artificially intelligent for that context. So it's narrow AI. General AI is the holy grail of artificial intelligence, which is can we make machines that can think for themselves and learn anything that we throw at them? Uh, I We are not there yet, and, and I'm not sure if in my lifetime we'll be there, there anyway, but it's a big field of study today. And it's a moving goalpost. What is general and what's narrow kind of changes as we achieve more and more things in this field. Why, why is AI so big now? Uh, so what happened suddenly that we are talking about AI everywhere we go and we hear about artificial intelligence in every single place we go? Two things, one is data. And, and this file kind of tries to put that in perspective. One caveat here is that this, this picture or the study is from 2019. So it is an old picture. If anything, we have far more data now. But even looking at the picture in 2019, right, we are seeing that an average internet user was generating about 25 gigabits of IP traffic per month. Uh, in a single day, a smart car generated two times that amount a smart hospital 120 times that amount. And as we keep going down this left side bar and we see we're talking 50 petabytes, which is about 800 times the amount that one person generates in a month generated by a smart city uh, per day. So huge, huge uh, treasure troves of data. And if you scale it up to 2022, there has been increase in terms of the growth of devices, connected devices about 3x. So 17.7 billion devices to about 
28.529 billion devices in 2022. So the quantity of data that is generated is, is huge and difficult to fathom. But at the same time, there's a lot of insights that are hidden in this data that can be used for different applications, different usages, different things that people want to do with it. So AI is kind of evolved and kind of emerged as a tool that can actually look at this huge amounts of data, which is definitely not possible for a human or, or even thousands of humans together to look at and efficiently get insights out of that and be able to understand what that data is telling us. And the second thing is, is compute. Obviously, when you have data that's of this scale, you do need machines that can process these data in efficiently in real time in some cases and be able to actually hold that kind of compute load. And, uh, you know, thanks to companies like Wait, us. Yeah. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not able to see your slide. I'm only seeing your face. Is that with, happening with everyone? Oh, we are seeing your slide number four. Yeah, that's what you should be seeing. You might no, sir, we, see. we could not see even the earlier slides which ABC. We are only seeing your picture. Oh, just click on the slides. Same here. Yeah, that would do. Oh. Slide number four. I, I think if any of you are able to see my slides, then the problem might be on your side. You might just want to. No, no, no. Now it's OK. Now, it, now we can see. OK, let me know if, if it goes bad again. We can try and fix it. Sorry so now that. we can see the slides, but we can't see you. <laughs> you cannot see him. You can see only him at the bottom. Yeah, that's usually there should be a small window at the bottom that where you see the speaker. Yeah, we, we are seeing you. Please I guess on. as long as you can see slides, oh. we're okay. Yeah. That's more. Uh, see, if you'll see yeah. your slides and hear him, that's more than enough. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, I was just speaking about the growth in in compute. The fact that you know computer performance has increased exponentially over time, and last decades saw compute improvements both in CPU and GPU fields, has allowed us to actually do this kind of an, uh, analysis on this this huge data sizes that we are seeing now being generated by these different sensors. So that's the main reason why today or, or these days we are seeing uh, a big interest in AI and actually these usages of AI actually you know, crop up. In terms of how the analytics curve for AI behaves, uh, these are the five pillars or five different stages that people more or less talk about in AI. Uh, the two main uh, categories for these are one descriptive and diagnostic analysis, which are basically looking at data in hindsight, operational analytics, so to say, which basically looks at data and helps us understand what happened. The three on the top, which are predictive, prescriptive, and cognitive, basically allow us to not just understand what happened, but also predict what might happen in future, which is the real intelligence part, right? When we can predict and think of it as a human being trying to catch a ball. Every time we sense the ball coming towards us, our mind makes a calculation on the ball's trajectory, the physics of the whole thing, and tries to adjust the hand accordingly until this ball is safely in our hands, and that happens in an iterative loop. So there is analysis of understanding what's happening, but there's also analysis of what might happen next. Uh, that, that involves prediction and cognitive abilities. So all these together kind of have emerged in different fields. Algorithms have been developed just because there's enough data to learn from, and there's enough compute power to run those algorithms on, and that's why we're seeing such a big emergence of AI now. Now let's go from this huge, big discussion of petabytes of data to very small example of uh, how to detect or how to learn maybe handwritten digits, right? This is a very typical example used in deep learning world uh, to teach uh, how deep learning works. And usually the first example that any deep learning engineer or a scientist uh, starts with. Uh, here we have uh, uh, some data from an open source data set called MNIST, uh, where many people have written digits from zero to nine in their own handwriting. And we have about, I think, 10 samples here, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, about 10 samples here. And each of them are like zero to nine, and everybody has written them in their own way. Let's take one example. Let's take five. And if you look at the digit five, the way it's written, it's completely different for every single individual sample. And apart from maybe the row four, where it actually looks like a three, most of them a human being can easily say that it's a five. But if you had to give this problem to a computer and say, can you recognize the digit here, saying that it's a five, and this is the bottom row is how a computer usually writes a five or, or prints out a five or inputs uh, of a five, 
actually in binary, but but there is a standard format. And and if everybody wrote a file the same way, we did not need artificial intelligence. We could just figure out how pixels are arranged in an image and, and just tell a machine to recognize it. But the problem comes when everybody writes these digits differently, and we want to build a system that can recognize a digit that was written by someone. No, there is no rule based system in the world that one can code and say, you know, if you look at this image, it's a five. If you look at this image, and, you know, there are so many human beings on the planet, we can't necessarily have every single example available to us. And we can't also say that if you if you look at certain pixels at certain intensities, that means it's a five because in many cases, for example, five and six look very similar to each other. Very hard, right? To to just discriminate based on this. So what do we do? Uh, we look at another example, which is a human being, right? All of you, I'm assuming, were able to see that this is a five, uh, with the exception of maybe one of these digits, which I wasn't able to say, for example. And similarly, you know, looking at objects, uh, here's a sketch of a cat, cat, very easy for a human being to say that it's a sketch of a cat. Believe it or not, doing the same thing for a computer in a traditional manner is a humongous task, because there's nothing in this sketch that actually looks like a real cat. In fact, we, we humans can look at a simple circle with whiskers on both sides with two eyes and say that it's a cat. And again, there's nothing that actually relates that to a real cat in a real world. And if I had to program something that could analyze what this what this diagram or what this sketch meant, and it did not involve artificial intelligence, it would be almost impossible to do. So what are we looking towards? We're saying, how do we cross the gap of, you know, having digits this clean to being able to recognize this Assuming that we get some motivation from how human brain works. So just summarizing the problem, I have some digits. I want to input it into this black box of deep learning algorithm. And then on the other end, it should just pop out some values for me that tells me what those digits are. And what does this algorithm do? How does it look? Uh, this is basically how a neural network looks. And uh, I, I just would uh, ask at this point not to worry too much about all the complexities and connections in this network if you haven't already been introduced to neural networks. But at a very high level, uh, let's just forget about the complexity in the structure, but just remember that each bubble here does some computation. And once it does this computation, it forwards the result of the computation to the next bubble. And so on, we can you know continue all the way to the end. Uh, these uh, bubbles, are basically called neurons just because we want to compare them with human neurons. So in this case, we would basically input an image of a handwritten digit that would start at one of these bubbles. <laughs> Please can you mute yourself? Those who are not speaking, Mr. NC Day. Thank you. So. Uh, just to recap, so each of these bubbles are, are called neurons. Uh, they get this input, the pixel based input, maybe one digit out of this. They process each of these bubbles, does some processing on it, passes on to the next layer to one or more, generally to all of the bubbles, the result to all of the bubbles in the next one. And then it, all of them do some processing, send it to the next one and so on, all the way till they reach the end and the output is formulated. And if the network works correctly, then when we have a five coming in, one of these outputs will be excited and others will be zero. That one will be pertaining to digit five and we would know that you know, it's, it's a digit five. So uh, basically at a way, heart of every neural network are these bubbles or neurons and that's what makes a neural network tick. Where does the deep part come from is based on the fact that typically today's neural networks tend to have like tens to hundreds of these layers that we have just shown three or four here. And that's why it's called a deep network because you know you go deep, you add a lot of layers to the to the network, and hence the term deep learning. And I'll talk a little bit about what learning means. So, neural network and human neuron. Just in uh, a little bit of an analogy here, uh, human brain has about eighty six to ninety billion neurons in it. Each neuron looks like something like this. Uh, there is a connection called dendrites that that bring in information from neighboring neurons. There is a nucleus uh, which does some sort of processing. Uh, I'm not a, a neurologist or a neuro, neuro, neuroscientist. I don't really know. I don't think even we have enough information about what exactly happens here anyway. Uh, but the result of this is actually sent out through these synapses uh, that can transmit information out to the next set of neurons. And this is what a neural network is trying to replicate. Uh, 
uh, and it's an artificial neuron just because you know it's not a human neuron and and that's why artificial and artificial intelligence also comes from so an artificial neuron is an attempt to replicate the structure of a biological neuron for computation and each of this equivalent of a neuron is what that bubble is supposed to be that that we saw in the last uh, uh, last slide and is shown here at the top if i unpack that bubble we can see that there are some inputs coming in which is basically these inputs between layers going from the previous layer to the next layer each of these inputs don't all have the same importance they have different weights and that's what they are called each input has a different weight depending on see for example if it's a digit 5 we have some weight for some inputs if it's a digit 2 it's a different weight for different inputs so that ultimately when you go through these weighted inputs across the network only the real right in output will survive the rest of them will be kind of going to zero so weighted inputs are are just combined together which is just a sum of all the inputs weighted and then added together and then we have this nucleus which was a human uh, neuron nucleus that did some sort of calculation we have an equivalent for that which is a, some sort of a simple calculation in this case it's just a threshold calculation so if this number weight times the input uh, a sum of weight times the input is greater than some threshold, we output a one, otherwise we are output a zero. And that's basically a simple perceptron uh, that does a very simple calculation of combining input uh, inputs in a weighted fashion and then thresholding them. Now over time, there have been multiple different variations of this. There are different activation functions. There are different types of ways to assign weights, but at a very simple level, this is what it is. And, and if we take this and put a circle around this bottom picture, and, and map it to these neurons or these bubbles on the on the top picture and get tens of thousands of them and put them in these layers across end to end, we get what's called a deep neural network or a deep uh, deep learning system. Right? But the question still remains, how does this network actually figure out what is a five, what is a four, what is a three, what's a cat, what's a dog, all those things that it needs to do, right? Analyze and, and get information from the data that's shown to it. And if you remember, if you go back to the beginning of my, my talk, we said that it's all data driven. I, as a designer, should not have to worry about how this network actually is, is programmed and how it behaves uh, internally. So what does that mean? What that means is that every network behaves in a different way, depending on the values of these weights at each neuron and the way this activation function behaves. So all we need to do is some way use the data that we have to tell the network to configure its weights and configure its activation function. And if a network can do that, then it can teach itself to be able to learn from the data and then behave in a way for that particular domain uh, in an intelligent way like a human might have behaved, except that it can scale, it can use terabytes of data, it can process you know, lots of data in a short amount of time. So this is what makes it intelligent, right? We The teaching of the network by looking at the data and by teaching, but we set these parameters of weights and activations, and then using that learn model to then actually understand new data basically gives rise to the learning part of deep learning. The deep part comes from the fact that we have so many layers. The learning part comes from the fact that these parameters at each of the neurons are actually learned from the data and not necessarily programmed by a human being. Now, to summarize it now, if we had to look at a typical neural network, there are two phases that a neural network works in. One phase is the training or learning phase, wherein the neural network looks at a lot of data and tries to understand what this data is telling it. And by looking and understanding at the data, it sets these values of weights and functions, activation functions at each of these neurons. And then it kind of reaches a stage where you can actually use it. So how does that work? Uh, it's, a, it's a very well-known algorithm called backpropagation, which actually has led to the whole revolution in deep learning. But as a very simple way, how it works is, for example, if I was trying to tell this network to understand what it what is in these different pictures, right? what are these different objects, and I give it a picture of a bicycle, and it goes through the network, it does all its processing at each layer, and then it outputs a value and says it's a strawberry. Obviously, that's a wrong answer. What I do is I basically take that answer and say, no, it's a bicycle. You should have output a bicycle, not a strawberry, and then give that information back and run the network in the backward pass. Instead of going forward, which is from layer zero to layer N, 
I actually send it back from layer n to layer zero. And at each layer, the network looks at the error between bicycle and strawberry and tries to adjust its parameters of weights and its activations so that it can, if it's given the same picture again, okay, it actually outputs the same value again. So what happens now is that if I give it thousands of such examples, it starts to become more and more general. The backward pass error propagates and the network and the weights are adjusted so that they account for the error. And once these updates have been made, the next time a bicycle picture comes, it's more likely to actually call it a bicycle. And training phase for these deep neural networks is actually the more compute heavy phase because we are sending tens of thousands of input data samples through them so that they can learn and, and be able to then use the networks okay. uh, in the later stages. Was there a question? Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, this is Pardwaj from Commerce Ministry. Uh, you told me that cycle, uh, this, uh, actual input is cycle, output uh -huh. should also be cycle. Then right. how will this backward error be fed back to the system? No, it is not cycle. How will it detect? Yeah, so that's where we have uh, the training phase involves some kind of supervision. So uh, the the human or somebody who knows the label. So what we what we have is this data that we already used to train actually has the right answers associated with it. So all the bicycle pictures are classified as bicycles to start. with. So when we give it to the network, we know that it's a bicycle picture. So that's the training phase where a okay. supervised approach is used so that we know when the network is going wrong, which is so not what happens in inference phase where we don't know what the picture is. So program is modified so that the, when the input is cycle, it should also give the output as cycle. That is a, that all we tell it is. Yeah, all we tell it is that it's it's a cycle. We don't modify the internals of the network ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what we do is we send the network, send this bicycle picture through the network. Something happens in the network. All the processing happens. It says it's a strawberry. All we do is we say no, it was a picture of a bicycle. Please adjust your weights accordingly. There's no human intervention there. Oh, that's automatic. That happens uh, automatically. And that happens okay. because there's an error between a depiction of a strawberry and a depiction of a bicycle. And it uses that error at each layer. It uses basically the gradient of where the values are now and how fast it can actually go to the right place. And that gradient tells it how much to move for each parameter. Thank you, please. Normally, how many iterations are required before it comes with the right answer normally in learn during the learning phase? So that's a very, very good question. Uh, so training or learning tends to be very heavy if you do it in a traditional manner. Uh, in a, so there are three different ways to train an network. Uh, sorry for a little bit of a diversion here. The traditional one is called supervised training, where we have to do exactly what I'm saying here, that we give a lot of examples, and the more data the network sees, the better it becomes. So we usually have a, a measure of loss, which is, in this case, maybe I want one out of every 10,000 pictures to be classified wrong. And if I'm getting any more than that, like two pictures classified wrong in 10,000, then I keep training. Right? And typically you run uh, from a few thousand to tens of thousands of cycles through the network. So quite heavy right? in terms of uh, compute and time that, that you need to do to train these networks, depending on the usage, of course. Uh, and then, sorry. Uh, the, uh, you have unsupervised learning also yeah, in deep learning. That's what I was going, yeah, that's what I was going next. So, so that's the completely supervised. Okay, thank Unsu you. Yeah, the unsupervised way is where, where you don't have this kind of paradigm. You basically take a network, put it in the field, and ask it to start working. And, and it will make errors. But when it makes errors, there is someone in the field that's either telling it that that, that was a wrong answer, or it automatically figures out the difference between, for example, all the strawberries that it has seen so far and the bicycle, and it actually lose, uses, it tries to find that difference or that loss itself without a human intervening. So unsupervised learning generally works in the field. Supervised learning means you first train and then deploy. Uh, and then there are cases where we have what's called a semi-supervised learning, where you train some of it uh, initially, and then you let the model run in the real world, and it gets better and better over time in the real world. So there's some training happening even when it's being used. So so those are the three different ways. But if you just train a model that's supposed to be working on maybe you know petabytes of data, it will take some time and some compute resources to train it for sure. Hopefully that answers the question, but please feel free yeah. to ask it. If it does. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So then uh, once we have this uh, model that's trained, uh, we, we can use it. 
by using, we basically call it inferencing. And in this case, we can now send data that we know nothing about through this network, and it should be able to tell us what it is because it has seen so many examples and it has automatically configured itself. The main thing here is the fact that this whole gradient based back propagation that I was just mentioning has made sure that this network now understands how this data looks and it can start getting insights out of that data. So again, I think going back to the question that we discussed, generally, if we look at accuracy as a as a function of data set size, the more data a network model sees, uh, the more uh, accuracy it gets. And also if we see it as a function of the size of the network itself, like the deeper a deep learning network, the better its accuracy would be. So in both cases, we're actually saying that throwing more compute at the problem actually gets us better accuracy. Having said that, you know there are problems like this handwritten data recognition where you could just do 100 passes through the network and actually get 99% accuracy or maybe more. So some for some problems, it's it's OK to have a small three layer network with 99 passes of training, but others you're usually talking a thousand passes or more. Right. Now uh, I just want to quickly give a little bit of a history on before we go on the application side of the world on on uh, deep neural networks as a as an evolution over time. Uh, we have been lucky to be in the age where deep neural networks really took off and we all see their usages everywhere from uh, personal assistants to chatbots to actual you know climate forecasting etc but frankly the the roots go back to as early as 1940 right uh, electronic brain employed something like a neuron that are fundamental units of deep learning today uh, they were mainly used to realize logic gates at that time uh, so like your traditional computer logic gate implementation. Perceptron that I talked about that has this threshold function as an activation function came in 1950s. And then, uh, you know, they, they basically implemented what's an XOR gate, which was supposed to be the holy grail of compute at that time because you could do any computation if you can realize an XOR gate. There was a dark age or what we call an AI winter between 70s and somewhere in 80s when not many people actually uh, subscribe to the fact that deep learning or even building models that can look like human brains is actually a viable way to build intelligent machines. These days, uh, those days, uh, what we call symbolists prevailed, and symbolists are basically people who, who think, or the experts and researchers who think that it's better to use experts in domains and have them actually write down what to look for in the data explicitly and code the relationships between different types of data, then try to have a machine that teaches itself on how to learn. And that's what happened during this dark age of AI winter because um, many symbolists tried lots of ways to get intelligent machines to work. Uh, the deep learning was asking for too much compute and too much data that necessarily it wasn't available then. And then we kind of came to 1986 when Glenn Hinton and others talked about back propagation, which is how to teach these machines to learn which is what I was talking about, right? Take an example, see the error and feed it back into the network. And that suddenly opened the gates on deep learning because now we had a way to teach the machines to learn themselves. And even the problems that humans couldn't understand the structure of, now the networks can do it because they just have this automatic way of exploring the search space and finding what connections there are between the data. And then the compute, kind of kept up in many fields like computer vision, natural language processing. We had people developing data sets that people could use to build their models. And suddenly, you know, from this 1990 onwards, there has been an exponential curve of both adoption and new models coming up that deal with different kinds of artificial intelligence. What is SVM? Code vector machines. Uh, sorry, I jumped sorry? over that one. So, so these are basically uh, kernels of uh, higher dimensions that can uh, look at, so a data that looks very complex uh, in, in one dimension, if you map it to higher dimensions, sometimes can be linearly uh, separated into different categories. So SVM kernels are generally the kernels that, that are employed to do that. And you could, for example, replace your, your activation function, that threshold function with one of SVM kernels, and you could get better performance out of the network. So for a lot of time, SVMs were used without neural networks as a tool of classification, but now there is a lot of effort in actually combining SVM concepts with uh, traditional deep, ne deep neural network concepts. Uh, can you repeat the full form of SVM? Support vector machines. 
so these are basically uh, artificial intelligent machines that try to figure out what each category's vector support is in the higher dimension. So you can have multiple vectors that represent different categories. And then when new data point comes, they just try to find out which vector this point is closest to. So that's how they classify different data. Okay, right, thanks. So breakthroughs, uh, two major examples are, are image recognition and speech recognition. Uh, and again, as I said, even though the technology has been around for a long time, what has happened in, in recent times is that we have had performance from these deep learning systems that are far exceeding what a human can do. Uh, as an example, right, the error on, on perception using images, today deep learning networks do a much better job than a human can do. Similarly, for speech recognition, uh, today's assistants are far better, even in noisy conditions, that than what uh, many humans can do. And these studies are done using you know, recognition rates from, an, from a system and comparing it with a big population of people who have been asked questions about recognizing things and recognizing sounds, etc. cetera. So uh, the fact that you know, we've had so much data to train and so much compute, we've been able to build these systems that suddenly are working better than humans and, and the interest is kind of just ballooned out of that. And at the bottom, you can see a few examples uh, where at Intel, you know, we are applying deep learning to real world problems, including, you know, we heard about uh, the diabetic retinopathy from Abhishek Sir just before this, uh, similar work in tumor detection, in healthcare contextual classification of documents using natural language uh, for financial investors, oil and gas rich region search, uh, seismic data, you know, looking at earthquake data, et cetera, uh, better speech uh, assistance, especially for uh, autonomous cars, et cetera, and defect detection. That's something that I personally do. In, in industrial applications, at and, and gene sequence analysis are, are some of the examples that, that we have been uh, at Intel looking at. Uh, but beyond right, what we are looking at Intel, uh, there is a huge area of, of application of uh, AI and analytics, especially deep learning. Uh, obviously, I don't think we have time to go into each and every one of these, but you know, agriculture getting higher yields, education is huge, especially in this age of remote education where we want to understand if a student is actually learning what we are telling, if they are engaged. Uh, government, of course, you know, enhancing safety, research and more. Uh, then retail, media, we hear a lot about metaverse these days, right? Metaverse is completely built on AI. Uh, if we, if we, we don't recognize, if we don't find relationships between physical and digital objects, the metaverse won't exist. So, so there's a lot of deep learning there as well and other uh, fields that I have mentioned here. Uh, in the interest of time, I think, excuse me, Twitter is telling me I should hurry up. So in the interest of time, I think, uh, let me just show some more government uh, related or, or government specific examples. Uh, I'm sure these file sets are available for folks who want to see these offline, but uh, organizational advantages of AI in government are, are at places where we need efficient work. We want to manage costs and we want to make great progress on research because frankly, places where huge human uh, investment doesn't necessarily lead to results because of the size of the data and, and hard way to find connections is where AI and deep learning really uh, succeeds. Uh, some examples are like using natural language processing to automatically extract relevant information from intelligent sources. Uh, like documents, like previous files, you know, make connections between different documents and then enabling analysts to find some insights out of that. Uh, failure rate predictions, uh, whether the equipment is, is like industrial, military, what have you, uh, making sure that it's well maintained, it's ready to deploy when needed, uh, that can automatically happen using deep learning. Cyber anomaly detection for security usages, uh, for cyber security usages to looking at data and trying to figure out if something is wrong. And it's very hard for a human to do that. In fact, almost impossible, but but these systems can actually look at data and learn what is usual and what's unusual or what's anomalous. Uh, an example is this USCIS chatbot. I'm going to try and run this video, but uh, it's, oh, sorry, I think it just went to the, let's see if it runs here. So basically this Emma or the virtual assistant in, in USCIS or the United States Custom and Immigration Services is used to reduce the or automate the simple, well-defined tasks. We all know how hard and time-consuming it is to do these kinds of functions in various government bodies. But uh, if we can replace like simple tasks like asking typical questions with a chatbot that understands natural language, 
it can quickly and accurately solve customers' problems. And, and Emma, in this case, has been able to better explain USCIS decisions, coach individuals when they want some coaching on processes, et cetera, and being able to you know, decrease the processing and, uh, and response time for customers of USCIS. Uh, AI and judiciary, this is another big area uh, where we see a lot of backlog in cases in different courts. Uh, we see a lot of uh, paperwork that needs to be handled. And, and as such, you know, there's a lot of time between uh, a person asks for some kind of a uh, decision or justice from a court, and by the time they actually get the final decision. Uh, some examples here, uh, LA traffic court was getting 1.2 million traffic citations per year with two and a half hour average wait time. And traffic citations is fairly routine task, right? There's not a lot of variables here. And they basically implemented GINA, this traffic avatar that handles about 200,000 transactions a year and reduce the wait time to about 8 to 12 minutes for typical cases. Obviously, not everything can be done by AI. Some of these do get uh, up, uh, up level to humans. Uh, an extreme example is China, where they actually have replaced a judge with AI. Uh, obviously, there are hurdles on transparency, trust, explainability, and we have had a previous session on this about uh, building trust in AI systems. But there is evidence that at least routine tasks, which are more commonly done and, and don't necessarily have a human intuition requirement, can be automated and people's lives can be made easier when, when they go to get justice in these cases. Uh, gene sequencing, another one, astrophysics, protein folding, uh, seismol seismology are, are some other applications where DL and deep learning usages uh, shine, and we don't have time to go into each of them, but. Uh, definitely very interesting usages where uh, we can make use of research areas, uh, deep learning and research areas. Uh, another one where Intel is working now is industrial inspection. More than 700,000 residents in District of Columbia depend on uh, reliable wastewater removal, but it's very hard for a human to keep track of where there might be some anomalies or leaks, etc. So manual inspection, for example, takes about 80 minutes to inspect images that come from these different sites. And using this pipe sleuth or, or an AI based deep learning based algorithm that is down to 10 minutes uh, per report. Uh, another one uh, where Intel is involved is using finding missing kids, for example, right? Using data from different sources, different public uh, places uh, that comes in, and, and then finding insights out of that based on location, time, the type of person that's being uh, talked about, and making those connections using deep learning and then ultimately resolving that whether it's a missing person or some inputs towards uh, finding missing children mainly. And there has been a lot of success in empl employing deep learning for that as well. So even though we started with this handwriting recognition case as a toy use case, as you come make it more complex and look at the kind of usages, it's actually you know, world changing usages that can really benefit humanity in general. So wrapping up, you know, deep learning is a subfield of AI and ML. We talked about that and it uses neurons to learn from data. There are different variants of deep learning, uh, like and that can be divided in type of data they learn from, like video, text, audio, natural language, etc. They also can be divided the way they learn, and we spoke a little bit about supervised learning. That means you know you train it with a lot of data to begin with, unsupervised it just learns itself, and semi-supervised something in between. And uh, deep learning can be a great asset in applications that require extremely high level of human effort. And that cannot be solved by rule-based systems. If I don't know uh, how to tell a computer that this is what they have to look for, but I only know what I want, as a result, deep learning is the right tool to use because all deep learning needs is data and what is your end result that you need out of it, and it will do the rest for you. But having said that, there are still challenges. Uh, the main challenges include explainability. It's very hard to understand the decision of a deep learning system. Once they tell you that this picture is a horse or there's a defect here or this is the missing kid that you're looking for, it's very hard right now, at least in most popular models, to understand why it said that. Because you know it trained itself with, with input data and, and it does not give an explanation when it gives a result. And, and some of us are working on making that a little better opening of the black box, but it's not your typical deep neural network today. There could be biases in the system, especially in, pe in people facing cases, right? Where we're looking for, for example, face recognition. Uh, depending on how much training data was given, it could be a biased system that favors one section of the society or section of people versus the others. And one needs to be very careful in using deep learning systems in such cases and making sure that it's actually giving the results that are balanced. 
and there are other unintended consequences just because people tend to take a pre-trained system from someone else and use it for another application that they have in mind. And because it was trained by somebody else, you don't necessarily know the behavior uh, that it may actually exhibit in the field. So that leads to unintended consequences and could be catastrophic, for example, if it was employed in an autonomous car, right? Uh, so those kinds of things are still challenges that need to be solved. Again, we did talk about it, it a bit in, in building trust in AI sessions. So if you guys are interested, uh, there's a video, I think, already available on the website uh, to go out and look at that aspect of uh, deep learning in AI as well. So that's pretty much all I have for today, but I'm glad if we have time to take questions or I can wait till the end uh, for discussion as well. Thanks a lot, Mr. Tiku. That was uh -huh, right on time. Uh -huh. We do have a question in the chat room, so we can take a minute to take that one. Uh, so it is said. Can I mute yourself? Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Deku, the question is, it said that the first traces of AI are from around 1950s. Does deep learning evolution suggest that the concept of deep learning uh, was pitched before AI came into light? Yeah, maybe I should just look at the chat. chat. I, I There was some disturbance on the... It said that the first traces of AI from around 1950s. It is deep learning says that the concept of evolution of before AI came to light, not really. I think uh, Marvin Minsky in in before 1950s uh, actually has a really good book about. Uh, I think it's called um, social intelligence or something like that. So the concept of people trying to dream about what is an intelligent machine has been there even before the technology for AI came around, and and the attempts to build intelligent machines. Uh, where mostly connectionist or symbolic earlier, where a human being would actually say that if A and B happen, that means C is true. Uh, so those were the initial uh, intelligent or AI machines that that were built. Deep learning was a attempt that happened later, where people started to explicitly say that we are going to build a human brain. We know how a human brain is connected. Let's build a machine that looks like a human brain. So it is a subset, but it's also both in terms of conceptualization as well as realization later than your typical field of AI. Thanks a lot, Mr. Sudeku. Uh, with this, um, we're going to go on to our next session. Uh, it's been more than an hour now, and uh, you've all been uh, you know, patiently listening to all our speakers. Well, I'm sure you're all having a good time learning. Uh, I think we should take a pause for a moment and re-energize ourselves. So I would request you all to please sit back and relax as it's time to engage yourself in a fun activity. Um, for that, I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Ambika. She's our Intel AI for You coach, and she's going to take us through some fun AI experiments. Go ahead, Ankit. Uh, Ambika, please go ahead. Thank you, Swati, uh, for introducing me. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, I'm audible, right? Yes, yes, you're audible. Go ahead. Okay, great. So uh, let me just quickly share my screen first. OK, so we all have been uh, listening to uh, the deep learning session so far, and it has been quite insightful. Uh, now we are going to get into some experimental uh, quiz, but for which now this time every in every session we have a quiz, right? But this time I'm trying to base it on a video. So we are quickly going to see a video. And based on this, we are going to have a quiz later. OK, so watch this video carefully. Thank you. 
Okay, so that was the video of a deep mind AI experiment. Now we're quickly going to go through a Kahoot quiz. Now to participate in this quiz, all you need to do is uh, go to kahoot.it as it is uh, shown on the screen. Just go to your browser, write kahoot.it and there it would ask you for a pin. The game pin here, here is 600-1282. It is shown on the screen and you can look at it uh, uh, on your computers. So let's quickly enroll ourselves in this quiz so that we can begin. Okay, we have 11 participants already. That's great. Thirty eight participants so far. So let's wait for one more minute and then we'll begin. So while everyone is joining, let me just give you a brief as to how it is going to work. Now, as soon as I start, the questions would appear on my screen as well as your screen. You have to read the question carefully and you have to answer the question by selecting one of the four choices or selecting in either true or false. Now, based on the amount of time that you have taken to answer the question and whether your answer is right or not, you would be allotted points. So the person who gives the fastest correct answer would have the maximum points. So we can take it as a competition. And I guess we have 55 participants and we are good to go. Those who are still trying to join, um, you can keep uh, trying because you can join midway as well. So let's begin. Okay. First question, DeepMind AI is an experiment of which company or organization? Okay, five seconds more. Fourteen correct answers. So those who might have seen the video carefully, yes, it is a Google experiment. Uh, so 14 correct answers. Let's see the scoreboard. Umesh on top. Then we have some bizarre. I don't know how to pronounce that. Then we have a Ram and Bob the Builder. Sorry. OK, let's go to the next question. True or false? 
DeepMind AI is based on rule based AI algorithms. You can take reference to the previous session that you just now took. And answer accordingly. Five more seconds. OK, 14 correct. So it is not based on rule based AI algorithms. It's based on learning based AI algorithms. OK, the scoreboard has changed. Umesh has retained his position. Ram on second, A third, Pradhan fourth and Devi Datta fifth. Let's go to the next question. Incentivization is based on which type of deep learning algorithm? As you might have seen in the video, the A, the DeepMind AI was uh, incentivized to go from point A to point B. This might be a little difficult. Wow, we have got 30 correct answers. Reinforcement learning, that is the right answer. OK, Umesh still on first. A is second, Ram third, Pradhan is on streak with three correct answers on fourth and Samza on fifth. Fourth question, DeepMind AI developed its own intelligence under negligible supervision. Is this true or false? OK, five seconds more. Great, 31 correct answers. Yes, it uh, developed its intelligence under negligible supervision. OK, Umesh is now on third, Ram on first, Pradhan second, Devi Datta fourth and A fifth. Let's go to the fifth question. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Yes or no? Five seconds more. Forty correct answers. Yes, it is a subset of machine learning. OK, Ram on first, Pradhan second, A third, Devidatta fourth and Bob the Builder fifth. Sixth question, which of the following input was not provided to the DeepMind AI algorithm? Now in the video, it was shown that uh, the DeepMind AI algorithm was provided with a few inputs. Now which one was not given? Twenty five correct answers. Yes, it was not instructed how to walk. With this. We have CME IT MCF on third. That was a good jump and Siddhant on fifth. That's great. Now we are going to our last question. Which is. Which model was used by AI in DeepMind AI? So there were um, different kinds of models used. Which one? Thirty seven correct answers. It used three different kinds and the correct answer was all of the above. OK, so with this, the results are on third we have A. OK, congrats on second. We have CME IT MCF and on first. We have Ram. Congratulations to all three of you. I would request you all to please put your name in the chat section so that all of us can congratulate you. Swati, uh, back to you. I hope everyone enjoyed this quiz. Thank you. I'm sure. I'm sure, Amrika. Thanks a lot. Your session was uh, indeed fun, engaging, and a lot of information. I'm sure each one of us has uh, learned a little bit more about deep learning.
So thanks a lot. Over to our next session. Uh, I'm going to request our eminent speaker and UNTP representative, Mr. Vahan Marti Josian, to talk about some successful use cases of how government of Armenia and UNTP have come together to enable Armenia's development potential and accelerate the implementation of SDGs. Mr. Wangman, you are the data scientist team lead at the UNDP Armenia National SDG Innovation Lab, where you are responsible for the design and implementation of software solutions and analytical reports to promote uh, data-driven public sector innovation in the Republic of Armenia. Over to you, Mr. Wangman. Thank you very much, Swati. Uh, namaste to all our Indian colleagues. Uh, it is an honor to take part in the uh, first Digital India Dialogues for 2022. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yes, my name is Vahan Martirosyan, and I am the Data Science Team Lead here at the SDG Innovation Lab at UNDP Armenia. Uh, now, oh, sorry. I, uh, uh, sorry, Swati, I uh, keep receiving the, uh, the uh, people that are being admitted. If it's possible to uh, remove me from this list, uh, you're or, going to be removed from. I, I keep uh, receiving a pop-up for new people being admitted into the into the call. Okay, okay. Uh, Anita, could you please uh, help us here? Uh, Mr. J. Okay, I will continue now. Uh, so yes, uh, the. We'll SDG take it the SDG Innovation Lab was founded in 2017 as a joint initiative of the government of Armenia and UNDP Armenia. And uh, it has two primary goals that as they pertain to data science. So the first one is to promote data driven public administration and public policy making in the government of Armenia. And the second major data science goal is to develop human centered technological solutions to improve the quality and efficiency of public policy and public administration. Um, and uh, we have four teams uh, that are currently active within the SDG Innovation Lab. Uh, obviously, I am a member of the data science team. Uh, we also have a design thinking team, a behavioral insights team, and a policy team. And uh, the uh, people working uh, in these teams are, come from very diverse backgrounds. We have people from, you know, uh, psychology, law, economics, uh, public policy, and uh, me and such as my colleagues, myself, uh, data science, mathematics, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the physical sciences. Um, and we operate in several sectors. Uh, so over the last five years, we've uh, touched upon uh, 12 primary sectors as a team in general. And uh, data science in particular has been very active in obviously AI and digitalization, education and employment, uh, health, tourism, road safety, defense and social service protection. Uh, and uh, now I will uh, begin presenting some of the projects that we have done, and I hope uh, you know this will uh, provide a practical understanding of you know uh, what AI looks like on the ground, uh, at least for some use cases. And I'd like to thank Mr. Omash as well for providing kind of the academic and the uh, technical background behind some of the things that I'm going to touch upon. So yes, uh, our projects. The first project I would like to talk about is uh, called AI for Mulberry. Now, uh, Mulberry is the software which is used by the government of Armenia to process different documents, whether they be internal government documents uh, or uh, requests, applications and complaints that come from outside of the government, from citizens, uh, NGOs or uh, private institutions. Uh, now, what we actually saw was that over the last several years, uh, as uh, adoption of digital technologies was kind of democratized, uh, the number of digital communications between the external world and the government of Armenia um, increased dramatically, and uh, uh, you could perhaps even say exponentially. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, scaling the labor force to meet this demand was not a very optimal solution. Uh, especially when we had technologies such as natural language processing and artificial intelligence at our disposal. So uh, we decided to uh, develop uh, software which, uh, you know, takes these uh, communication from the citizens and uh, automates its processing. 
uh, and by processing, what I mean is it automatically determines which ministry, department, or branch within the department this particular piece of paper uh, belongs to. So uh, let's say if you are writing with regards to some uh, sort of, I don't know, uh, some concerns concerning your medical uh, care, then the AI algorithm would detect that this is pertains to health and it would detect, send it to the Ministry of uh, Health. And then in the Ministry of Health, it would detect that it pertains to some department and then some branch within that department. So um, in order to develop, uh, 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 can everyone see the pipeline that is uh, yes. featured? Okay. So in order to develop, in order to develop this algorithm, what we had to do was integrate our servers, the SDG Innovation Lab development servers, which are powered by uh, powerful GPUs, graphical processing units, to the government-owned servers and databases. Uh, and uh, this is very important to mention. That has a very uh, important cybersecurity component. So by connecting to these databases, we were able to take <clears throat> data concerning uh, both the structure of the ministries themselves with all of their uh, departments and branches, so on and so forth, as well as all of the documents and all of the text that came from citizens of Armenia into this system. Uh, we then did a, so this, uh, we loaded this into our servers. Here you can see this as labeled in MongoDB. This is the database management uh, service which we used. We took a step to clean the data. So uh, here you can see we, for, we cleaned the destinations, destinations being departments and branches in the government. And we cleaned the text, which is the text within the documents provided by the citizens. Uh, having cleaned both of these, we built a data set. And a data set, as Mr. Omesh mentioned, is essentially a list of correct answers uh, that the uh, artificial intelligence model would then have to look to uh, a, a neural network, again, uh, very uh, uh, well described by Mr. Omesh. And uh, the neural network essentially learned the patterns for categorizing uh, this for categorizing text within this hierarchical structure. And we actually um, received some very interesting results. So uh, we uh, our studies showed that the average uh, public employee in the government of Armenia takes approximately 5.3 minutes to process one A4 sized uh, digital paper. And by process, we mean determine where it should go, uh, whereas it takes our algorithm approximately one second to do so. Uh, and this is this includes all of the back end stuff that needs to take place for you know, the data to travel between its relevant servers, which is essentially uh, over a 99% uh, saving in time. And um, obviously, we have not fully automated the system yet. So uh, AI from Mulberry currently acts as a recommendation engine. It recommends the government employee uh, of where to, you know, send the document. But we uh, already see that it saves 72 public servants who are concerned with processing of documents approximately 50% of the time during their day. And uh, this is very important because you can kind of see uh, the uh, what they can do with the rest of the time. They can use this time for more value adding uh work uh, rather than simply sorting through documents and you know doing these boring tasks um now uh, i actually prepared a small uh, demonstration uh, which kind of uh, based on the ministries and departments for the government of india uh, and this is meant to show you kind of the um the gist of uh, what we did for the government of armenia so let me just uh, change my uh, screen that i'm sharing Mm -hmm. Can everyone see this screen? New screen? It's coming up. Yeah. Okay, just let. Okay. Uh, so here uh, I provide, you know, some sample text. What kind of aid can pregnant women obtain from the government? Let's just say. Um, and uh, we run the model. And we can, it takes approximately 562 milliseconds, half a second. And it says that the top ministry for which this uh, text would be classified is the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Uh, and it has no sentiment, so it's not sentimental at all. Uh, but 
in addition to detecting the number one ministry or, or department within that ministry, it can also rank the departments with respect to their relevance. So it says, for example, that this is, first of all, women and child development, then social justice and empowerment, then health and family welfare. And then, uh, as we can see, the level of confidence drops. So a significant drop from 0 0.4 to 0 0.22. And we see the irrelevant results. Minority affairs, rural development, skill development and entrepreneurship, which are not particularly uh, you know, relevant for this case. And then we see the departments. So uh, this, this ministry did not have any departments within itself, at least as it was mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, link that I saw. Uh, so we can just move forward. Uh, another example for, uh, let's say, it says, I used to serve in the armed forces and have lost my service papers. Essentially, some very minute thing that can happen to anyone. And this can, you know, uh, contribute to a huge backlog of, you know, uh, communications with the government. So it's determined as Ministry of Defense uh, and uh, within the Department of Defense. So here we can see that defense is the number one uh, classification. Then comes housing, housing and urban development or urban affairs. Then comes personnel and uh, public personnel, public grievances and pension, and then so on and so forth. So we can see the relevance in the sorting as well. And here, if we uh, see which department within the, the Ministry of Defense this is classified in, we can see uh, that it is most likely in the uh, in defense and ex servicemen welfare. So again, very relevant and very uh, precise classification. Um, we can uh, look at some other tasks as well. Let's say, for example, uh, my hotel is a major destination for foreigners visiting our city. Can I get a tax exemption? Some, you know, uh, something that, you know, a citizen can uh, call to the town hall and say something like this. Here we get the fact that this is tourism, culture, and then the rest is uh, relatively, so the top uh, ministry is Ministry of Tourism. And then the second ranking with, you know, a much lower level of confidence is the Ministry of Culture. And, um, and, and we can actually take some time at the end of this uh, meeting, you know, to play around with this demonstration. And you can suggest some inputs of your own and we can kind of see, uh, you know, the degree to which this model um, can 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 meet our demands. But uh, this is something this is an idea of what we did for the government of Armenia and it saved us a, a good amount of time. Uh, let me uh, go back to my presentation now. Just bear with me as I open the presentation. Mm -hmm. It's working. It's back. So it says we can the see slide your presentation. Oh, uh, I, I can't see it. I can't see it myself. Uh, <clears throat> let me see what is wrong here. OK, here we go. I can see it as well. Um, OK, so let's go back to our slide. Um, all right, yes. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, as you saw, this was the uh, product air from Mulberry. Uh, I would like to go on to the second product, which is a, a monitoring and forecasting platform called Edu2Work. Uh, the point of Edu2Work is to bridge the gap between the labor market and the educational uh, institutions in the Republic of Armenia. The Industrial Revolution is uh, kind of uh, is having a huge impact on the labor market, with many new positions being opened that previously did not exist, and many older positions uh, being, you know, um, uh, being ir irrelevant from now on. And um, 
uh, our goal was to render our educational institutions, our public educational institutions in Armenia, more flexible in understanding this, the, the new skills and the new professional and soft skills that are required to meet the demands of the labor market. And uh, so we developed Edu2Work. And essentially what it does is it goes through all of the job announcement websites in the Republic of Armenia, and it gathers all the job announcements that can be found there. Uh, thereafter, using natural language processing, it extracts the relevant professional and soft skills that are seen within the, within the uh, announcements, in addition to the name of the profession, the industry in which the profession um, is required, and the company. Uh, also information concerning the level of experience that is required, and the location uh, where the job will take place. And what we do, in addition to using AI to extract these pieces of text from the from the announcements, we use AI to standardize these uh, things. So, for example, uh, if uh, someone can say, I don't know, uh, put up an announcement for software developer, and then someone else can put up an announcement for programmer. What we require is a standard notation for each of these. And uh, we therefore developed a supervised classification model that would take in the raw input uh, of some random job announcement, and it would classify the positions and the skills within an internationally recognized taxonomy. Um, and uh, there is actually a website that uh, you can go to, you know, it's freely available to explore uh, our results. It is called edu2work.am. Uh, I can uh, share with you uh, this page. We can uh, actually go through it together. One second. Mm -hmm. So, can everyone see the page, uh, the new page? Not as yet, Mr. Vaughan. Okay, I think. Yeah, now, now we can. Yeah, so edu2work.am, you can see it on the top. Uh, this is the home page, and here you can see a time timeline for the. Uh, job announcements uh, for uh, did the screen drop or can you still no, see it? okay uh, so here you can see job announcements for um, software development uh, and uh, you can see the increase in software development demand from you know july of last year to now and you can see the top professional and top soft skills that are required within this profession and you know uh, we can we can go through uh, sorting to see the uh, level of experience required. We can see the top uh, employers within the Republic of Armenia. We can see the top five demanded soft skills, and we can see the top five demanded professional skills, as well as the educational requirements that are prevalent. Uh, Now. You can also see the number of announcements and the number, number of number of announcements activated. And Armenia has a small population, so don't be surprised, you know, with this small number of active online announcements. And uh, you can also see kind of a bar graph of the top uh, currently uh, seeked professions in the Republic of Armenia. Uh, going forward, uh, as I said, we can uh, we can compare the demand for different professions. So, for example, here we have software development and we can compare this with accounting. Let's let, let the uh, algorithm load. So doing this comparison, uh, yes, the, so this is uh, this is uh, the graph for uh, accountants and I would just like to load both of them in one graph. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Here we can see that, you know, uh, last year, uh, in the summer of last year, there were approximately an equal number of job announcements for accounting and software development. But uh, after uh, January 2021, the number of software development uh, announcements just simply exploded. And, uh, you know, it's currently higher than accounting now. And we can also see the top professional skills that are required and the top soft skills that are required for each of these professions. Um, uh, yes, and we can also essentially do the same thing with uh, uh, skills as well. And you can also, uh, using our algorithm, we found kind of uh, um, 
professions that are related to each other. So by clicking on one of them, you can see, for example, software developers are very highly related with applications programmers, web and multimedia developers, and system analysts. Whereas accountants are highly related with financial analysts uh, and uh, financial and investment advisors. So this is just a tool that you can use uh, to that a public servant can use to better understand the labor market as it currently stands. And you can also, you know, do searches with respect to industry, professions, skill levels, so on and so forth. Um, uh, you can then uh, compare, you can then see the trends for skills across years with respect to the, the date. I won't go through this uh, now, just out of interest of time, but uh, it's something that you can play around with later on. And a very interesting portion uh, of this website also is the forecasting section. So uh, we have uh, an algorithm, uh, a artificially intelligence based algorithm, which does a relatively short term forecast for the number of job announcements. And as we can see, we are expecting a relative increase uh, uh, for the upcoming months. And this is something that we will you know, check back to see uh, you know, the degree to which this was accurate, in fact. Uh, and the last thing that I would like to show you in this regard is the uh, your place in the labor market portion of our uh, of our application, which is meant for actually people, uh, the citizens of Armenia, uh, more so than the government. And here you can in input your no, sorry. Uh, one second. So here you can see uh, the top uh, growing and declining professions. And and you can also. Uh, one second, let me go back here. Yeah, you here you can input your uh, professional skills and your soft skills, your level of education and your level of experience, and it will actually filter the currently available uh, job applications or job announcements and, uh, you know, give you an idea of where to apply. Uh -huh. So uh, let's move forward. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions concerning uh, uh, what we have seen now, you can just uh, uh, shoot now uh, while I'm uh, opening my presentation again. Uh, we have Mr. Sandesh, he's raised a hand. Uh, Mr. Sandesh, would you like to unmute yourself and go ahead? Yeah, yeah. thank you. And um, so I'll like, you know, great, great uh, session for sure. Uh, this ED2 work, uh, this model, so how, how uh, you know, we can make use of it or, or there is something which we need to do from, uh, from process perspective for using the platform or how, how we can make use of it. Just, that's that's a question. Uh, yes. Uh, so, if you would like to use the edit to work platform for the Indian labor market, what you would require is a pipeline. It's kind of da in in data science speak, a pipeline that gathers information from job announcement websites in the uh, republic in, in the uh, in India, and essentially build classification models and uh, parsing models which extract the relevant fields from this text. So essentially the steps you would need to take is to first build these data scrapers unless there is a standardized you know, platform where all of the announcements are currently collected in India. I'm just not sure about this. So if no such platform exists, then what you do is you collect you, know, you collect this data in a real time manner or at least on a daily or hourly basis and uh, you develop a data set. So the data set essentially consists of several things. Uh, you need several sets of data sets. One data set would be essentially raw job announcements, just the raw text with, without any processing with the targets being the portions of the announcement that you would like to extract. So this may pertain to skills required, experience required, educational level required, so on and so forth. Um, 
sometimes you know websites have these already in a standardized manner but sometimes they don't sometimes they're simply in the job announcement so this is where the parsing comes in and then you build a artificial intelligence natural language processing model which uh, does this extraction automatically thereafter after having extracted the, the uh, announcements you have to standardize the skills so you have to standardize the soft and professional skills to uh, uh, a taxonomy that either the in government of India already accepts or one that is internationally accepted. And here is a task of supervised learning. So what you do is you build a data set of, for example, all the different ways of uh, saying software developer, all the different ways of saying accountant, so on and so forth. And uh, you build a classification model that would uh, you know, do this categorization automatically. And there are a number of ways of doing this. You can use uh, different types of neural network architectures. Um, some, some more popular ones now are called transformer-based language representation models. Um, so I would be happy you know, to go more in depth in this later on if, if you require more details. Sure, sure. Thank you. That helps. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, so the next project uh, that I would like to present is called travelinsights.ai and this is a platform which uh, does something similar to edu to work but it is meant for the tourism industry so tourism is a strategic sector for the uh, Armenian economy and uh, we uh, wanted to build a tool that would give decision makers or public policy makers in the tourism sector uh, real-time understanding of, uh, of of how tourists of what tourists coming to Armenia are happy with and what they are not happy with. And uh, in order to do this, we actually uh, began gathering data from the most you know, internationally recognized platforms such as TripAdvisor, uh, Booking.com, and uh, Facebook, Airbnb, so on and so forth. So we collected user reviews and other metadata concerning users. And what we did was we extracted the topics within the reviews using supervised uh, artificial intelligence models. We extracted sentiments. So essentially, is this a negative comment or a positive comment? Uh, uh, I, is there a problem with the presentation? Uh, can everyone see the presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we can't, Mr. Okay. It's okay. 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 Perfect. Um, yes. So, uh, as I said, we classified uh, the reviews with respect to their topics and their sentiments, and we built the, the, a platform which you can actually see on uh, travelinsights.ai. You can visit the site yourself as well. I will show some things uh, right now too. So. What it does is it classifies it between uh, negative and positive sentiment and 27 topics, some of which are included here, so such as customer care, food and drinks, comfort, entertainment, so on and so forth. Um, now I will uh, just go through to uh, the website itself. Okay, so uh, here's the website. As you can see, we have collected 193,000 uh, uh, reviews from the website, and we have analyzed 176,000 of them. Uh, by analyzed, we mean uh, categorized it with respect to sentiment and topics. And uh, the reason that the number is smaller than all reviews is because some reviews were really not, uh, you know, suitable for topic and sentiment classification. They may have been like uh, some empty reviews or something that was not clearly legible and could not be confidently classified. So um, we have gathered over 500,000 insights from these 176,000 reviews. And we can, as you can see, we uh, rank the top compliments and the top complaints of tourists coming uh, to Armenia. And if we, if we are interested, we can also filter with respect to the, uh, the place of origin of the users themselves. So it includes the entire world. You know, we have some users from India. We have some users from the Russian Federation. Obviously, uh, it's, the high, it's the largest user base. We have users from America, Canada, and so on and so forth. Um, 
then what uh, we you can see uh, the uh, different sentiment and uh, topic classifications with respect to the different types of institutions that are being classified. So, for example, we have a lot of reviews for hotels uh, and then restaurants, museums and attractions. And we can see that, you know, most of the comments are positive, but there are also some negative comments as well. And for example, a decision maker, a public policy maker would actually see that there is a far larger proportion of negative comments on hotels than on restaurants. And this is kind of a cue to public policymakers to understand that there is a, perhaps an issue with the hospitality industry uh, and the hospitality industry is lacking in quality behind the uh, food and entertainment industry. Um, we can see also uh, this positive and negative sentiment across time. Oh, sorry. And we can see this across time. So as you can see, we had a very rapid increase in the number of positives, some a slight uh, smaller increase in the number of negative comments. And then here we see the impact of COVID-19 actually. So uh, as COVID-19 hit in the beginning of uh, January and you know travel restrictions were put in place, the number of reviews uh, declined very drastically. And this is kind of a proxy indicator of what actually happened in the Armenian tourism industry as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's also kind of a signal to policymakers to somehow act. Um, you can also explore everything region by region. So you can select, you know, this is, for example, the capital city. Uh, you can select other regions as well. And you can also compare two regions between themselves to see what what is the difference between some of the things that people like in one region or the other. Uh, I won't go into too much detail in this. Uh, but uh, I think you get the point. And you can also kind of zoom in. You know, this is Armenia. This is the city of Yerevan, the capital city of Armenia. And you can zoom in to different destinations. And uh, for example, you can I actually isolate specific destinations. So I don't know, comfortable apartment near Republic Square. This is something from uh, Airbnb. And you can filter, uh, you know, everything by this location to see the reviews. And what we actually do, uh, one of the things that we use this for, and it's not something that is visible here, it's a service that we provide to the government, is we give alerts for different topics of interest. So for example, if a specific location, so a hotel, let's say, or a number of hotels that are clustered in a very closely together, uh, suddenly start receiving uh, a large number of complaints concerning cleanliness, this, is an, this goes as an alert to the government of Armenia. And if there is a trend, then what can actually take place is that a, um, professionals are sent to see whether there is an actual you know, health-related issue in the particular hotel or the restaurant, and uh, whether this goes against you know, the uh, government-mandated uh, codes of conduct for cleanliness. Uh, and this is something that uh, is an experimental tool, of course, and uh, I'm happy to say that there have not been, uh, <laughs> you know, many cases where this was needed to be used. But this is just a good example of how open source intelligence, this very popular kind of term, OSINT, can now be used and can now be leveraged for on the ground intelligence concerning what's going on in sectors as diverse as, you know, the tourism industry or the labor market. Um, here you can see more detailed breakdown of the different, you know, complaints and compliments, uh, compliments and complaints that uh, we got from uh, from tourists. A bigger breakdown is also available. I could expand the list, but I just, you know, won't waste the time to do this now. Um, and we also provide a uh, price timeline for uh, accommodations in the Republic of Armenia, tourism accommodations. And we saw a very interesting trend recently uh, of essentially, you know, prices averaging out at approximately 20,000 dirham per night. This is approximately 40 to $50 per night, and then drastically increasing to almost $100 per night for several months in the late summer, early autumn months, and then decreasing uh, back again. And you can also filter this with respect to each of the regions to see, you know, uh, if uh, what the price trends in each of the regions are. Uh -huh. 
Uh, and this is uh, kind of a, the summary of uh, our tourism industry monitoring tool. Um, you can uh, shoot any questions that you would like uh, as I open <laughs> my presentation again. Great. In that case, we have a question from Mr. Dinesh. Uh, Mr. Dinesh, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, uh, have your question on? Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Uh, as we know that there are five sectors in the economy, namely government, non-financial sector, financial sector, household, and non-profitable uh, non institutions, institutions serving households. So I yes. would like to know uh, about uh, something about these in Armenia, whether the Armenia uh, has a standardized AI program for all these five sectors so that uh, there is a compatibility of data sharing. Uh, so um, th the, sh the short answer is actually no. So as of now, we do not have kind of a standardized uh, platform that can target each of these industries themselves. But what we are doing is we're uh, kind of scaling it uh, one step at a time. So as, as the SDG Innovation Lab itself has the goal of uh, you know, targeting as many sectors as, uh, you know, uh, possible. And you saw kind of a quick, uh, I can actually go back to this slide. You saw some of the sectors in which uh, we were involved in for the last five years. And this covers, I think, a good portion of what uh, whatever you mentioned. Uh, and we are now expanding, you know, the use of data science in each of these sectors uh, as wide as we possibly can. Um, but I will say that it is relatively difficult to have a platform that kind of standardizes and combines sectors as diverse as the ones that you mentioned. So it may be the case that, you know, uh, separate solutions for each of the sectors may be more relevant than, uh, than one that, you know, targets all of them. Uh, and this is also, you know, usually true for or uh, simply training machine learning models. So usually you would have a pre-trained model that has a good understanding of, you know, the general context of, let's say, in natural language processing, the general context of what's going on in a specific language. But if you want it to perform well on a specific task, such as classifying tourism reviews, you really have to train it on this task. And the data sets and everything have to come for this task very specifically. Um, and uh, the process of you know collecting data sets for all of these sectors, standardizing them at all at one time and putting them into one platform, I think it would be somewhat difficult to do just from a organizational and you know a work point of view. If, at least if that answers your question. No, uh, I will supplement it. See, uh, you have given an example of labor market. Labor can be in any of the sectors. It can be in government, financial sector, non-financial sector, oh, I see what you mean. and they may interest in you know. jobs. So today I'm working so, in the common sector, tomorrow I can work in the household sector or financial sector. So when I change my job, uh, my 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 uh, uh, salary role or other factors or maybe the experience, if I share the data with other industry and if there's a compatibility of the program, it can be easily achieved. Otherwise it will take, uh, I mean, it will, it will create a hindrance in sharing of the data and uh, understanding the program or, 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 or in fact developing different AI programs for dealing each and every situation. So standardization of uh, uh, programs and uh, all these things, I, I think it will make the situation convenient for the uh, industries, work for workforce and other related uh, uh, para, uh, I mean, uh, areas and sectors. As, yeah, as far as the... the so as far as our tool for the labor market, edu to work is concerned, that is fully standardized for every sector of the economy. So you can actually filter the industries and you can go into the public sector as well. And you can see the different skills and the different professions that are currently available or have been historically available in the public sector. And you can also see um, you can also see the degree to which the skill sets for the public sector have changed over the years. So uh, I think that goes a bit in line with what you're saying in, in the sense that 
everything so uh, we treat the IT sector in the same way that we treat the government uh, the public sector so you can actually align the different skills and uh, professional requirements for both of these sectors and you can compare them and contrast them and if you if you are interested in changing your profession from something in the public sector to something let's say in the entertainment industry you can then uh, play around with our find your profession uh, you know uh, module and this can give you an idea of the types of skills that you need to change or you need to obtain uh, from scratch in order to to make this transition thank you um so if there are no more uh, questions for now uh, you can go on okay yes so um, uh, I would just like to make a small concluding remark with regards to our you know, international partnerships. Uh, we uh, here at the SDG Innovation Lab, we're very interested in, in international partnerships and we uh, work with public private institutions and NGOs, uh, you know, from Russia to Colombia. And we do a number of different collaborations with them. And what the, at the heart of our kind of uh, ambition for international cooperation is the fact that there are tremendous, you know, international synergies in both the problems that we have and the skills that we have that can, you know, uh, that we can share and uh, to speed up the process of uh, of, of bringing data-driven data decision-making and artificial intelligence to the public sector. Um, so, and uh, I think the uh, case of Armenia and India has actually been a very good one for the international community because uh, one, of the one of the most popular and most uh, well-respected IT training centers here, here, here in Armenia is the Armenian Indian Center for uh, information technologies and it's been responsible for training you know thousands or perhaps even tens of thousands of IT professionals uh, here in Armenia who currently work in Armenia and perhaps even abroad and the center has also done a lot to uh, build computer labs in over a hundred schools all over Armenia so it is it has a very uh, kind of robust history of uh, collaboration between our governments and I just hope that um, you know uh, the SDG Innovation Lab and the uh, Armenian Indian uh, IT centers they can provide the provide a framework and a foundation for you know continued cooperation between our governments and our countries. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, yeah, I'm open to any questions if you have any. Thanks a lot, Mr. Vaman. If anybody has any questions, uh, please do share with us. Uh, you can probably write in the chat window or raise a hand and we would love to take those questions. Uh, on that note, Mr. Vaman, thanks. Thanks once again, and uh, it's time for us to conclude today's session. And I uh, believe and hope that all of you have enjoyed listening to our online speakers, learning from them. Uh, they have shared very insightful, um, you know, learnings, their presentations, and uh, uh, experiences of working with the, you know, the other governments. Uh, that has been very great, and uh, hope that we will see you all once again in our session. I'm also going to request you all, uh, I'll put a feedback link in the, in the session and any feedback coming from you is going to help us uh, improve our uh, uh, you know, continued series in, the, in under this Digital India Dialogues panel. So I'm going to put that in the chat room. In the meanwhile, we would encourage you, if any other questions you have, please do share with us because uh, we're learning a lot from your questions. Uh, I have uh, posted the feedback link for all of you. Uh, could uh, one of, uh, uh, maybe Anita or Mr. Vikram, could you just uh, ensure that uh, the, you received the link is there in the chat room and it's open for me? Yes, Swati. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Mr. Vikram. Uh, can we also take a group picture of uh, all of us who were, uh, you know, who've taken out some time and efforts, you know, to join us here? Just one uh, group picture we can have. You can open your uh, uh, video for a bit, and I can take a screenshot for all of us. Thanks a lot.
please remove this uh, PPT so that you will be getting it on the main screen. Sure, sure, sir. Uh, Sidhan, can I request you to take the thanks? I think we may have to take off the spotlight. Probably that's how we can get a screen of everyone. There's a together mode in the menu. Right now we are seeing, yeah, yeah, that's better. Don't don't forget to tell when to smile. Yeah? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, somehow to me, it's not coming in one uh, summarized uh, picture. All the videos. Maybe because I don't have the other right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Vikram. So thanks very, very much, all of you, and uh, stay tuned. We'll have the next session coming up. Our speakers, thanks a lot for uh, the insightful presentations, uh, you know, how you have uh, shared your experience and uh, your learnings with us. Uh, and thanks a lot for the audience who's been there. Uh, you've been all so encouraging with your questions and how you participated in our uh, gaming session as well. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, NEGD, our, all our uh, government speakers who've been with us, uh, UNDP and Intel. Uh, you know, our uh, collaboration could make this series possible. And uh, we look forward to the next one now. So thanks a lot and have a great day. Once again, I'd like to uh, request you all to fill the feedback form for us. The link is there in the chat room. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that.